welcome to episode 15 of the Brannigan Communications Podcast. I'm Kathleen, your host this week, and I'm joined by my company co-founders, Tom and Sally Brannigan. The topic today is a great one, celebrating the company's 15th anniversary. Can I get a Yahoo? Yahoo! (laughs) Yahoo. (laughs) I like your enthusiasm, Tom. So tell me. So let's have a conversation. Let's talk about this. All right. Let's go way back. Clear your minds to 2004. That's 15 years ago for those of us doing their math in in their heads. Yes. So 15 years ago, uh, I was uh, finishing up a job and we were thinking about what the next step was and we had talked about having our own company and we actually thought of different things we thought about remember we talked about like a like a radio station we talked about a franchise uh with with an organization that we really like products we really liked and then sally made the in retrospect obvious observation (laughs) maybe we should pick something that we could actually earn a living doing right that we had some track record common theme through the last 10 years so uh, we thought about it, we talked about it, we prayed about it quite a bit, and we decided to try to form our own communications company. And that was, yeah, roughly the end of 2003, beginning of 2004. Sally, what was your perspective on that time? Well, it was, a, we had been in Milwaukee for, oh, about four years? Four or five? Yeah, four or five years, and... Um, we had had some interesting jobs and a lot of success and grown as a family. We had little kids at the time, and it really seemed like a good time for a change. Yeah. So what about some of the early challenges, the things that people don't tell you about, like you have to change your own toner, <laughs> you have to well, <laughs> find your own office space, and just some of the early kind of Or work from and, your spare bedroom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was... Again, in, in retrospect, that was difficult because Brannigan started out of our spare bedroom and Sally came to me one day and she said, you know, you're not happy in the spare bedroom. You've got, you need people to bounce off of. You're a social guy. You're a type A personality. And so at that point, ironically, we were asked to co-pitch with a local agency in town, Meyer and Wallace, and they asked us to be the PR part of a pitch for one of their prospects. And it worked out and they got the business and they gave us the PR part of it and we ended up moving in with them and subletting from them for two for years? About a year and a half. Year and a half? Yeah, I think um, it was two. Yes, and also and right around that time we got our first, I will call anchor client. I had worked out in Seattle, which is where Sally is from, where I met Sally. And I worked for a transportation company, and they were acquired by DHL. And as Brannigan was in its kind of infancy, one of the people in charge of the customer migration process, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the sales migration process of those two companies called me and said, look, we need a comms interface for this. So they became, DHL became a very early, rather large anchor client for us through my relationship with that sales guy, who's a friend to this day. And, who I credit a great deal for helping us get started. But that was a big challenge, the whole working out of a spare bedroom, kind of that solo thing for me. But once we started subletting from Meyer and Wallace, things started to kind of take off. Yeah, I remember it the same way, that it felt much different. It felt more legitimate somehow when it wasn't from the spare bedroom. And getting an anchor client or two, um, you could take it to the next level in terms of investing a little bit in the, in the business. And then ultimately, when we got an employee, it was like a whole whole new world. I had also interviewed. We were thinking about forming a company, but I was also interviewing because we weren't sure yet how that was all going to work out. And one of the places I had interviewed at is Johnson Controls here locally. And when we started Brannigan, the person who ended up getting the job that I had hired for, her name's Monica Levy. And... When she started the job, she asked people at Johnson Controls, I'm going to need some communication support. Do you know anybody? And somebody said, maybe it was Glenn who said, this guy interviewed, we all liked him. He seemed like he knew what he was doing. You should call him. And she called. I interviewed with her. 
instantly, instantly loved her. Super, super smart, very collaborative. And she hired us and became uh, a real advocate for us. And uh, without her and those early clients, the company wouldn't be the company it is today. We owe a large debt to Monica Levy and some others who really took a chance on us. I mean, I, you know, I, I told her at the, at the time, you know, we were nobody. We were this random Milwaukee based, very small company, it had some really good experience, but did, had not cut our teeth yet. So the people who took a chance on us, we have, of course, a lot of affection for and a lot of appreciation for. And long client relationships with. Long client, yeah. Friendships, yeah. yeah. Right. 15 years worth. So some of those early years, what are, as entrepreneurs, because because that's absolutely what you did, started a company from the ground up. So what are, not to put you on the spot, but and we can come back to it, but what are some tips for entrepreneurs, maybe people listening that are thinking about starting their own companies and um, you know, a couple of things that you learned early on? Well, a lot of my learning curve was about the nuts and bolts of doing the finances and books for a company. I feel like Tom's side of it is more interesting in the sense that when I pull back and look at what he learned and how how bits and pieces of the way we did business turned into this company, I feel like a lot of it was about telling the truth and relying on your relationship, relying on your friendship with the client and your um, a, just a great relationship to be able to say what they want to hear and what they don't want to hear. And to be honest, that's like a hallmark of his personality and it's really translated into this business. So maybe the tip is to figure out what is special about the way you approach your relationships and translate that into work. Because I feel like that's what the foundation of this thing is, really. A kind of honesty that is rare. Yeah. Well said. Always so well said, Sally. Oh. Sally's the soul of the company. I, I get a lot of credit because I'm the face of the company, but Sally, what she's done with being the chief financial officer of the company, and we aren't always in agreement, but when it comes to the financials, I defer to her 100% of the time. And to have somebody, and this is, again, the statement of the obvious, there's no, there's no substitute or panacea for marrying the right person. So, you know, I feel every day, I feel, and I've said this before if people here have heard this I wake up every day and I'm like I won the lottery I'm married to this wonderful intelligent person who challenges me constantly in a, in a constructive and loving way and that has been a huge people think or, or people will say oh you got to work with your wife well I love working with my wife but part of the reason it works I think is our jobs are different mm. we both kind of have our own area of the company and I think it's probably when you're talking about like what have you learned I, like all people, have mentors, and I've, I've had mentors. My wife has been a mentor. Kathleen, you've been a mentor to me. Um, my, my parents, uh, I would not be here, we would not be here without the influence of my parents on me and your parents on you, Sally, um, and frankly, your parents on you, Kathleen, um, who has not mentioned it yet, but she was our first employee and was the only choice to help found this company and is the president of our company and is an exceptional, exceptional person, human being, and leader. When you, when you talk about what have I learned, my Uncle Tom told me when I was very young, I was worried about college and getting a job, and he said, Tom, you know, you're looking at this wrong. If you're, if you're willing to work hard and to listen and to be open to criticism and put your head down and get stuff done, things will happen for you. The harder you work, the luckier you get. That was a, a really big piece of advice that I, I, I took into my heart and every day I try to live that. And there's a man named Andy Gronick here locally. He is, uh, again, a wonderful human being. He and his wife are just tremendous people. And he mentored, he, he has mentored me over the years. And he said something to me. I called him for advice on something early on, like year two. And I blah, blah, blah to him for a while, and he was very patient and listened. And he said, you know, you're looking at this all wrong. He said, he said, you know, the mistake you're making is that you're managing out of a place of fear. You're afraid that a client will fire you. You're afraid that you're not going to do great work. All these things will or will not happen. You can control the work aspect. A lot of this is out of your control. And when you manage from a place of fear, 
you increase, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but when you manage from a place of fear, you increase uh, the, the chance that you're going to make a mistake, you're going to second guess yourself, you're not going to trust your instincts, and you'll increase the chance that you'll be unhappy. So those are two pieces of advice that pop when you ask that question about kind of what, what have we learned yeah, I mean, numerous things over the years, and fortunately, we've learned them together. Absolutely. <laughs> some of the some of the happy times and some of the challenges. Um, you know, no no better people to be, as you say, in the boat with, right? So, let's take it up a notch. So, what about God some happy? So, what are some of the the memories? And then we'll we'll get to closer to today to present day, but some of the more fun kind of memories as you reminisce and look back what what are some things that stand out some highlights <laughs> i can think of a it, couple <laughs> it's funny when you look back like if you get a little bit of distance it's the in the trenches times that turn out to be your good memories even though in the moment you're like that was a challenge not a happy time <laughs> yeah. you know i'm thinking of you guys at irish fest in the trailer oh, oh man <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, you know, things that come to mind for me from a business perspective are winning our first big piece of business, like those early days. Like Brian Wickert here locally at AccuNet Mortgage, he was our first client. He was our very first client. Uh, or was he second? Was he after DHL? Barbershop Quartet was our first client. <laughs> Okay, how do, how do I not know these? Okay, before there was even you, Kathleen, No, I know. I there know. was I mean, who could think of a time writing. before, but yeah. Barbershop <laughs> Quartet. That ended, I don't know if that was paid. That might have been pro It was bonus. paid. So, it was ladies and gentlemen. It was. It was $400. It was. I, it's the first, like, yeah. accounts receivable we was ever had. So, the first? Yeah. so what I've learned is we're here because of a barbershop quartet. And we're done. <laughs> I will tell you. I will tell you. We're laughing about this. But that organization, and I want to say they were based in Racine, Wisconsin, just wonderful people. And I remember I went down there and they said, you know, we wish we had more in our budget, but would you like to sing with one of our quartets? <laughs> and there's this... Paid in kind by wow. the chance to sing. And, and I remember awesome. the song. It's from Oliver, the song, Where is Love? And I got to sing the tenor, the melody part on that, and they just they just all came in behind me, and it was awesome. People who do that, I mean, it was awesome. So we should have okay. a podcast on the barbershop quartet, probably. That's hysterical. That's awesome. Yes, but that I mean, that's th- those are are great memories. I cut you off about Brian Wickert. That was oh, anyway, yeah, the no, Brian time. Wickert. We owe a debt to him because every time an organization with equity an organization that had a name for themselves hired us that helped us you know get other clients talk about hey we're working with this company we're working with that company we're working with DHL we're working with Johnson Controls I can't overstate the amount of credibility these people just by I mean they took flyers with us Monica Levy didn't know me from Adam she didn't know me from anybody so these people really took a risk with us. So we're, again, forever indebted to them. But yeah, those, I mean, winning big pieces of business, of course, great. Winning against competition that's much bigger and a uh, little more glitzy, a little more, hey, you know, than we are. We're pretty, like, what you see is what you get down to earth. Uh, winning against a global communications conglomerate. We've won against a couple really big shops. Uh, those have all been, you know, really good shots in the arm for us. Um, what feels um, happy to me and, and kind of landmarkish is every once in a while, the I look around at a staff meeting or just a regular event and think our team is so incredible, our people, and that combined uh, unique constellation of gifts and talents and care for each other that to me even though it isn't punctuated at any given time by a, a party or a landmark it's really those are the happy times to seeing people work together seeing the work we can accomplish it's amazing yeah and sometimes I also think and this is a kind of a different sort of path but when we've lost, either we've lost or been fired, because it's happened. Right? Sure. I mean, those have been some of the biggest growth moments. And I, I wouldn't say they've been happy times, but they've been huge times that we've had to kind of self-reflect and take a look at what we've done and or didn't do 
um, in that process. And it, so again, not a happy time, but certainly times in our history where, you know, we've grown and done it differently or done it better. You are so right. And the the one of the realities in this business is you will get fired. Yeah. You will get fired. Somebody else is hired and they have a relationship with another organization or somebody comes in and you know doesn't like the work you've done for whatever reason or you know somebody comes in and it goes up for review or I mean that's just part of the deal. And that to varying degrees with the three of us has been difficult to get comfortable with because that's that's life. So you know, how do you inoculate yourself against that? Well, you build the best organization in the world, which is what I think we've done. And Sally's absolutely right. We are nothing without our people. Our our team is our most important assets. It's not brick, brick and mortar. It's not intellectual property. It's not, although those things are all important. It's not our computers and our servers. It is our people. We have surrounded ourselves with people who know things that we don't know mm -hmm. because this is not a time clock micromanage. It's like, if you get hired at Brand again, you go, you do your job, and you you know you have a lot of autonomy here, um, it, it, and and they 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 know things that we don't know. They are driven, they have ethics and integrity, and it is a true blessing to be able to work with the people we do. And those aren't our idle words. I mean, you know, we reflect on this a lot. Well, and I think too. I mean, there's such confidence with the team, and certainly everybody on the team knows things. <laughs> At least I don't know, right? I mean. Does Amen. anybody know something you don't know, Kathleen? <laughs> no, but I mean, there's confidence in when you get a new client. It's like even, let's say you don't have experience in the space. It's like we take, you know, the the experience we do have in the in the industry and apply it. And by and large, typically it works. Yes. Right? I mean. Yeah. You know, it's uh, kind of funny. Telling the truth, doing great work, and owning your mistakes actually works. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Actually works. So what about from a technology standpoint? So if you think about it back in 04, Facebook was a blip, not even. It just, it was just starting. Um, you know, social media wasn't a thing. Technology, especially when it comes to communications, is so, I mean, it's advanced the industry so much. I mean, so how do you think we've evolved as a business given what's changed in our space. Well, do you want to take this? No. I think that <laughs> well, the speed of communication, of course, has increased. Yeah. I think where we have been a little anti-hero with especially social media is when it all popped, everybody ran to it and they embraced it, as did we, but a lot of our competitors sold a lot of business on social media platforms that at the time were unproven. So this gets into the ethical kind of backbone of the company. We said, look, we're going to invest in it. We're going to hire people that know how to do it. But we're not going to sell $50,000 programs to companies where we can't determine what the ROI is. Because anybody, any good leader is going to say at the end of six months, eight months, ten months, what is the return for this? And so until, until we were more comfortable with that, we got our ducks in a row, but we didn't sell it a ton until about, I'm, I guess I'm looking at you, Kathleen, about five years ago, seven years ago. Yeah, I would We say started that's about really right. selling it, and then we decided about three years ago that we needed a, to formalize the capability here. So we were kind of, it's not that we cobbled it together, but we were in it, but I think we really well, started we learned. owning it. Yeah, yeah, I think we learned enough about it so that we were able to responsibly say, yes, we can do this for clients. The biggest industry conversation and actually um, disagreement I had with people is when social media hit, people said, that's all we should be doing. Social media is where everything is. That's the only thing that matters, etc. My argument was and is social media is an arrow in the quiver, but the fundamentals of what we do haven't changed. Uh, consumer insights are still important. Being yeah. able to tell a compelling story is still important. Creative ideas are still important. Because one of the downsides of the ubiquity of where we are with communications now is this idea that more is better. More is not better. Yeah. More can be more junk, more not useful informa information, things that don't help the client. Um, I ask as a joke, sometimes I ask Marquette students, so what percent of social media content do you think is has value, has real value? And these college students, 18, 19 years old, say, I don't know, 10% has value. And yet that's what we're doing. Mm 
Mm. The, the, uh, the emergence of video, when you talk about how it's changed, uh, we're so much more involved in that than we were mm. you know, 14 years ago, uh, 15 years ago. Um, so those are the things that pop. Well, and that's interesting. You say, you know, even the college students of today are saying 10% because most of it's noise. So it's still who's your target audience? What's your business objective? Absolutely. What's your communications objective? And, and starting from there. I mean, we've had a client, um, or we've had times, I would say, not a client, where um, people will come to us and say, I need a social media strategy. And we say, okay, well, what's the challenge? And oftentimes it's not a social media challenge. There's some, right. so, some other sort of business challenge there. Sally, what about in the last 15 years from an operation standpoint and, you know, what changes have you seen and what um, kind of where, where we are today would have been kind of your biggest learnings? Do you mean technology? No, or? I mean more from, from a kind of operation standpoint as I we've think, gotten bigger. I think it's the size. Yeah. Like, so the scale of what we do and the amount of planning that has to go into things now we were so nimble when we were fewer people and with every new employee comes a little bit more need to plan and we've we've done that kind of not on an even curve so we get to a critical point where we're like okay we need to behave like a little bit bigger company and get more processes in place and mm -hmm. I mean to me the biggest uh, change in terms of operations was when we got to the point where we could and needed to hire an office manager. That was yeah. huge. We suddenly had a level of um, continuity and uh, just a, a breadth of service to the employees as well as in terms of billing and mm -hmm. those things that we had never had before. And it really it shows in the quality of our work and the quality of our day-to-day -day operation. Do you have more on that? No, no, I think that's a excellent answer. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always like tipping point of being having policies and process, but not over processed. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and so there's act. always that yeah that careful balancing act. What about today? So let's talk about today and where the company is um, and where we think it's going from a you know from an industry standpoint. I mean, we've we've changed a lot since that first. Which one is technically the first client? <laughs> I'll defer to my CFO for that. <laughs> the first one on the books is the barbershop okay. quartet. All right. So since then, so fast forward 15 years, um, and I, I think a lot of the same, as, as you said, the same principles apply and kind of how we do business. But so where are we now? So how have we evolved? Like how, Tom, would you articulate that? Well, we've, we've, we've grown. We've been very lucky. We've been able to add team members. We've gone from one person to we're about 20 today, which is kind of, and, you know, people say, oh, yeah, you work at a small company. And I think, man, it doesn't feel small, you know, when you build it up from that. But, yeah, right. we're a small company. But there's, there's, uh, there's uh, advantages to that, too, from a cultural perspective. Right. Being able to you know do things that larger companies can't do, uh, and you know this has become a little cliche, but we are very agile. You know we have, I, I think I have two or three people right now that serve one of our larger clients, and when they have big projects, we can pull in five other people and we can do it relatively easily. Um, so that's that's fantastic in terms of how we've evolved. Uh, Kathleen and I, for those of you who don't know us, Kathleen. Uh, is very adept, well, she's adept across the board, but she loves the consumer stuff. She loves creative ideas for consumer stuff. I'm a corporate guy. So that kind of... You also have creative ideas, Tom. I had a creative <laughs> idea in 2012, and that I have not that true. framed on my desk. That is not true. We use Tom's ideas all the time, just for the record. Uh, but you know, Kathleen is it has an uncanny ability of just pulling stuff out of thin air. It's just, it's just, I, I so respect and admire that. Uh, Thank you. It's rooted in strategy, though. It always, <laughs> for prospects listening to this and clients, always, always rooted true. in strategy. Uh, so, uh, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's never happened before. It'll never happen again. Well, you were talking about uh, our size, but from, um, oh, from a, a content standpoint, and from right. in, like, like in terms of what we offer now that we didn't offer in the past. Absolutely. We were known as a PR shop initially. 
And now and we haven't been a PR shop for a decade. Exactly. And we haven't been a PR shop. So, you know, it, we're much more integrated. We are integrated. Creative capability, video capability, digital. We do a lot of strategy work. In fact, we've kind of moved away from the pure tactical stuff because when the client says to you, I need a, you know, I need a hit in USA Today, that's kind of a one and done thing. And it's a very kind of one dimensional way to think. So if we don't know the context around that, so I tell this story sometimes, a client actually said that years ago. And I said, well, why do you need a hit in USA Today? Well, our competitors just got a big, you know, article in USA Today. Or I'm saying article in the age of digital, I know. But we, you know, <laughs> we, just, we, we just, just, just got this big story. And it was a Me Too kind of uh, driver. And I said, well, why did they get the story? Well, they had this new technology and they got this. Really, well, do you have that technology? Well, we kind of do, but we don't have it as well as them. Well, why don't you have it as, as, as you know, why isn't your offering as robust? Well, we haven't invested the money. Why haven't you invested the money? Well, we've been focused on emerging markets. So what, what started as uh, I want to pay you to do media relations became you don't need to pay us anything right now. You need to figure out where you're spending your money and why. And, and that's another thing with us. Uh, we don't, and I think our clients sense this, we're not in it for the short-term gain. We're, we're in it for, hey, if you have a project, we're not about proving ourselves, even if it's a low dollar you know, project, we're happy to do it. We hope you love us, we hope you come back for more. But if we're not the fit, we're not the fit. And I think you need to be okay with that. Just like you need to be okay with being wrong. Sometimes you're just wrong. Kathleen and I were talking <laughs> about something last week. And I really I'm wanted sure to. I was wrong. Yeah. Oh, I, that was a bad. That was a bad segue <laughs> no, about I'm being kidding. wrong, Kathleen. Uh, no, no, I'm joking. Uh, last week, I, I there's something I really wanted to do, and Kathleen's like, "I know you want to do this, but have you considered X, Y, and Z?" And I'm like, "I hadn't." And I looked at her, and I'm like, "You know what? You're right." And this this is another like when you talk about what you've learned over the years. I think society, not to get all philosophical, I think we've stopped making arguments for what we believe in. I think we argue based on our emotions or based on what we think somebody wants to hear and all these things that at the end of the day are in the ether. They're not, they're not solid. And being able to make an argument, going into a client and saying, this is what I believe and this is why being open to being wrong and just letting those chips fall is something I see less and less of. You know, we live in a society today where it's like, well, you know, I really don't want you to say anything that's really gonna upset me. You know, we hear this a lot. And I use this example again with these Mar Marquette students. I say, can you imagine a scenario where a client calls us and says, you know, this project went sideways and we're really upset about it and we're really concerned about a relationship with Brannigan. Can you imagine a scenario where I say, you know, you're hurting my feelings right now. I'd like you to use different words and I'm gonna still bill you, but could you just not criticize me? <laughs> and you know, you're laughing, no. but we see this all the time where we're criminalizing speech, we're criminalizing making a good argument. And I think that part of our success is, you know, whether we win or lose, we make an argument. And to be able to do that is is really powerful and sadly differentiates you both as a company and as professionals. Well, it's an argument, and I, I agree with you. It's an argument, but it's also, and we say this, we've said this for 15 years, have a point of view. Right. If you don't have a point of view, then you are not at the table adding value and you are not, then why should someone pay you for your services? Exactly. If you, and you know what? A client is a client and at the end of the day, they get the, the final decision because it's their resources they're using. But what are we going to do? Just come to the table and be like, yeah. And Tom says this a lot. We're not going to be order takers. We're going to be consultative and we're going to have a point of view. That doesn't mean it's always going to get activated, but mm -hmm. it sure as heck means that you know, you, when you hire us for our opinion, we're going to give it to you. And we have an adge, uh, average client tenure of seven, eight, nine years. And I think one of the reasons, it's not always, you know, sunshine and unicorns with clients. Sometimes you disagree. But I think one of the reasons they stick with us is they know we're not just going to be like, yeah, back. whatever you want, yep. I'll bill you Friday. It's going to be like, A, do we agree? Does this make sense to us? And B, is this something that we can provide, or is it like with the whole USA Today thing? Is it something, look, you have an issue. It's a larger issue. Yeah, right? is it a legal yeah. issue? Is it an R&D issue? Is it something like that? But I mean, getting back to us, our yin and yang, you're so great on the consumer side and corporate too, but you love that. And I'm really, I love the corporate stuff. I love the emergency response stuff. I love the reputation stuff. 
and that's proven. And then we have Sally who comes in and so often as a finance person, we'll have insights for our clients that just complete are, are total game changers and just make it stronger because you're coming from it from a very different perspective. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I mean, often I can't tell you, I don't, I can't even count the times where Tom and I <laughs> have come to the table with an idea, you know, to resource something or, you know, to, to go in some sort of direction or to invest in something. And Sally always comes to the table with a very, with a financial lens, yeah. right? And that has worked, that balance over the years because when we talk about kind of what's the tipping point to continue to invest, you had talked about like early on, like, you know, your first employee and then, oh my gosh, you know, leasing an office. But, you know, I think the balance for the three of us over the years has been, where do you take risks? Where do you take calculated risks? And then where where don't you bet, right? Or where we, don't you go? We complement each other. I think that's one of the main things that you either fall into or you have a great skill at um, ferreting out people who complement you. And both you and Tom have an innate kind of instinct about people that has served us so well in terms of clients, employees, the whole gamut. Uh, but finding people that compliment you and that are good at the things that you're not good at so that you can balance out to be a smart operation. That's, I think that's yeah. part of the magic. <laughs> so as we sort of look at it, reflect on our 15th year, it's 2019, um, what, what advice would you give listeners in terms of continuing to keep it fresh continuing to keep, you know, to keep, and I can't believe I'm going to say this word, but innovation in the business, continue to reinvent ourselves. Because I mean, as we counsel our clients, brands that don't reinvent themselves don't last. So what, what are, what are, as we look to the future, you know, what are the kinds of things that we're not doing, but thinking about, and then also what would we, what, what is the advice that we would give others? I think it comes down to the continuing to grow or evolve comes down to curiosity. If you're not doing something that makes you curious and makes you want to learn what's new and what's on the horizon, then you're probably in the wrong spot. Finding what makes you want to know more is part yeah. of the, the goal and makes a good life too. Yeah. Amen. I'd say, and I mentioned, I referred to this earlier, surround yourself with people that know things you don't know and who, and, and make sure you create an, an envi a cultural environment where people feel like they can come and talk to you and say, hey, I think we're doing it wrong, or hey, I think there's a better way to, to do it and not feel like there's going to be reper negative repercussions. Uh, some kind of landscape survey, we've done this a couple times. We have a third party, somebody we trust who is super sharp, Landscape survey, the the field. What are best practices? What are trends? Don't assume you know it all. Don't work in a bubble. Don't get myopic. Uh, those are things I think that are super important. Consider how you can bring good into the world. What can you do that is truly good and truly pure? Because you look out there and you see there are a lot of shysters and there are a lot of people who you know they want that short term gain and. And that can't be what it's about. Um, some of our dearest clients are very small. Some of, from a yeah. from a mm -hmm. revenue perspective, and they are dear to us. Not to get all hallmarky, yeah. But you know, people can sense insincerity. Insincere. Let me repeat that. <laughs> people can sense insincerity. People can sense insincerity. <laughs> you talk about like pitching the media. Yeah. So you have people who've, you know, who've been, you know, been reporters, been journalists, and they can sense it if you're being sincere or not. Clients can sense it. Either you really care about them and care about producing great work that drives value, that drives share, that gets their customers to sign on the line, which is dotted. ABC. In a way that's the ABC, always be closing. <laughs> if that's where you're coming from, I think you'll be successful. Yeah. No, absolutely. And um, I have a couple of other questions for you. 
name your favorite band. <laughs> this is a doozy. Musical youth. It's the who, of course. <laughs> there is no other answer. There is no other answer. And for our listeners, I don't know if they know if they haven't been in our office space. We have uh, three conference rooms, and who are they named after, Tom? They're named after the best rock band of this or any generation, <laughs> which is, wait for it, the who. <laughs> also, there, this is an age-old question that we've asked, I think, every employee that has come through here. I'm going <laughs> to ask you. Cake or pie? Pie. You know, we've been married 25 years, and I've not been able to convert you to cake. But cake is the clear answer. <laughs> what about you, Kathleen? I'm the worst, because I'm right on the fence there. <laughs> I like both. I would probably skew cake, but I do love pie. It depends on the holiday. It depends on the type. I know. Also, I'm so wishy-washy. Which cake and which pie are we talking about? Yes, exactly. You're such an analyst. Is it chocolate? Is there fruit involved? Then right. I go cake if there's fruit involved in a pie. Anyway, the last question. Is a donut cake or bread? It's cake. It's definitely bread. <laughs> and this is why it you. works, ladies and gentlemen. I don't even know you. Uh, one, one thing I would like to add, you talk about like what made us successful and I've alluded to this but uh, faith is a really big part of this and the way I look at it without God's grace none of this none of this would be here none of this yeah. would happen so every positive interaction every difficult interaction where you learn something that's all by the grace of God and I give it up to him every single day and we're encouraged our culture encourages us not to talk about our faith but as a Catholic, it's just been a huge part of not only how I approach my day, but how I treat other people. Like when somebody says, oh, Tom, yeah, you're a nice guy. Or yeah, yeah, it does happen, by the way, every once in a while. <laughs> I, I've seen it once or twice. It's like, that's <laughs> not me. That's just no. my belief system. And um, and I think because it's our 15th year, it would be a, a miss not to bring that up. That, you know, when we formed Brannigan, I mean, there was a lot of reflection. There was a lot of discernment. Hey, can we do this? Because as you've heard, and I think everybody here has heard, you know, the world doesn't need another communications company if they're going to do it like everybody else does it. So there, it's just been this pursuit of the, the uh, true and the good, mm -hmm. and how do you do it better than everybody else? And I think that we're, you know, slowly but surely making our way on that path. Tom Amen. And, Amen. Tom and Sally, congratulations on 15 years. Thank you. And cheers and to all more. Of you. And Kathleen, congratulations to you and to our team. And to our team. And we look forward to celebrating 20, 25, 30, 50. What was that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Congrats. And maybe the best part about our team, actually, is that they laugh at like 40% of my jokes, which, yeah, considering true. the age discrepancy, is a minor miracle. That percentage is a little high, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. 15%? Um, 15%. Yeah. Nine and a half. Congrats. Thanks for leading this today. Thanks, Kathleen. You bet. Thanks for joining us. Let us know what you want to hear next. Send us a message on Instagram at Brannigan Communications. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast network and leave us a review. See you next week. <laughs>